Our brains and perspectives are fundamentally dualistic. Conscious existence is composed of an endless rhythmic war between our reductionistic and holistic modes of perception, more simply known as logic and emotion. But this duality is inherently imbalanced, which we can see clearly in the structure and function of our brains. In this series, which I call Dominance in Duality, we will explore how the projection of these neurological imbalances shapes our conscious experience. In the first video, on the paradox perspective, I describe the two processing streams through which information flows within our brains. As a quick review, the ventral stream, which runs down and around, processes information about specific objects or what things are. The dorsal stream, which runs up and over, processes information about relationships in time and space, or where we are compared with our surroundings. The where pathway combines our awareness of relationships between our body and the environment, so we can rapidly respond to external events with actions of our own. We can see this in the brain as the dorsal stream overlaps with the motor and somatosensory cortices, the brain regions that are responsible for planning and executing physical actions. This informs our behavior with relational models of spatial and temporal relationships between our body and our environment, like, something is rapidly approaching your head, duck. The nature of the dorsal stream is holistic and global, since it deals with relative motion. We cannot assign a spatiotemporal position to an object if it does not have a relationship with another object. A single solitary thing does not move, because it has no frame of reference, so there is nothing else to measure its movement against. In the dorsal stream, the world is a continuous and intricately connected web. This is a perceptual reality in which everything is related to everything else, no matter how tenuously. On the other hand, the ventral stream operates in a local reductionist way, since it deals with categorization. The only way to categorize is to break down the world into digestible segments, with defined boundaries to separate things from other things based on characteristics or features. A particular feature, like furry or four-legged, can be applied to many things, but one thing cannot be another thing, like a cat cannot be a dog and even two cats will be differentiated from one another on the basis of some individual difference. Every thing must, by definition, be a unique object with its own unique set of features. Therefore, the ventral stream perceives the world as a binary sequence of individual units. This is a perceptual reality in which everything is disconnected, no matter how similar any two things may be. One of the ways that the ventral stream, or the what pathway, performs this task of disconnection is with language. Our incoming sensory information is broken down into linguistic comprehension so we can understand details about what we perceive. The seemingly contradictory realities of pure connection and complete disconnection of the ventral and dorsal streams are often explained as the left and right brains. This is an oversimplification, but we can see why it is easy to think of it this way if we look at language processing in the brain. In the left cerebral hemisphere, there are two very specific regions that are required for language comprehension and production, Wernicke and Broca's areas respectively. When Wernicke's area is damaged, we lose the capacity to understand both written and spoken language, but we can still produce language. It just lacks the underlying coherence of meaning. The following video clip is an example of this kind of specific brain damage, called Wernicke's aphasia. What were we just doing with the iPad? Uh, right at the moment, they don't show a darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> with the iPad that we were doing? We, um, like, here? I'd like my change for me and change hands for me. It would happen. I would talk with Donna sometimes. We're out with them. Other people are working with them with them. I'm very happy with them. Good. This girl was very good and happy when I play golf and hit other trees. We play out with the hands. We save a lot of hands on hold for people for us. Other hands. I don't know what you get, but I talk with a lot of hand for him. We can see that the ventral stream overlaps with the output of Wernicke's area which is an indication of how strongly the reductionist processing of the ventral stream is connected with our language capacities. Interestingly, the corresponding areas on the right side of the brain don't seem to play an important role in producing or understanding the literal meaning of words. Instead, 
The right side of the brain is required for processing the emotional connotations that come from intonation and facial expression. Essentially, the left side deals with rigid overt definitions, also known as denotations, while the right side deals with fluid, context-dependent meaning, also known as connotation. The right side of the brain is important for linguistic communication, but neuroscientists do not have a specific name for the language processing centers of the right hemisphere. And this makes a fascinating sort of sense, because it is our left brain that operates in the domain of specific words, and in linguistic reality, it is not worth it, or not possible, to apply specific labels to the emotional and non-literal aspects of perception. This is one of the many symptoms of the dominance that the left brain exerts over the right. In this series of videos on dominance and duality, we will explore how the inequalities between the sides of our brains are reflected in every aspect of our perceptual realities. From the physical organization of our body, to our abstract conceptual spaces, and even in our culture and society. Despite the inequalities, we need to remember that both sides of this story are required to have a coherent worldview. Communication between the two information streams results in a mental workspace. And to us, this integration literally feels like a space that is filled with a stable sense of self, a representation of our environments, and the meaning that emerges when the two aspects interact. This space and its contents compose our subjective experience. It is a dynamic map of who we are and how we relate to the things and contexts around us, including ourselves. The way that we represent ourselves in relation to a representation of ourselves creates an endless hallway effect that makes our internal space feel defined but boundless, recursive but ever-changing, and deterministic but infinitely powerful, a contradictory combination of characteristics that many people call consciousness. In the next video, we will start to explore this space more deeply so that we can build to a thorough explanation and understanding of our conscious existence. Stay tuned for the next video in this series by subscribing to our channel, and please leave your input by liking and commenting. Thank you for watching The Paradox Perspective.